Lord, we, we love you. We thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for how good you are to us. And Father, we worship you today, but, but we shouldn't just worship you today. We should worship you every day because you are good every day. Help us to focus on you and nothing else right now. The work can wait. The relationships can wait. The food, the, the family, the friends, the, the fun, it all could wait. Help us to focus on you right now. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to old school today. 350. First, second, and fourth.
Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Lord, I thank you for being here with us today. I thank you that we have a God who lives. I thank you that we have a God that that breathes and guides and that we can trust in you. I ask, Lord, that you would bless Pastor Trent's mouth, that he would speak clearly, and your spirit would open our hearts. This offering be worshipful in our giving to you. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. We ready to get to God's word today? No? Are we ready to get into God's word today? Yes. 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 Let's pray, and then we're going to do just that. God, we thank you for this book. We thank you for giving us your words to study, to learn. Help them to transform our lives today. Help us to to let them transform our lives tomorrow and the day after that, God. We thank you again. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Continuing on in our study of the book of Luke, if, uh, and if, uh, last week, if you remember, we worked through the parable of Jesus at, 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 that Jesus was sharing with his disciples on the issue of stewardship. There was a, a rich man and a manager, and, and the manager wasn't doing a very good job at caring for the rich man's money. So he's about to get fired by the rich man. But just before he was fired, if you remember, he shrewdly looked out for himself and, and shorted the debts of all the people who owed the rich man money because he wanted to gain some favor. He wanted to get some, uh, some favor in the people who owed the rich man money, as, as many people as possible, before he was fired. So what happened when the rich man found out what was going on? Surprisingly, he wasn't very angry, was he? He didn't, he didn't seek to punish the manager, in fact, he admired the manager and, and, and his foresight despite his, on, his dishonesty. And the lesson that Jesus was telling his disciples here with this parable wasn't that they needed to be dishonest in the way that they handled themselves because that, was kinda, that would be contradictory to everything else that Jesus has ever taught before. 
But the lesson for his disciples was this. It, he, was, he was hoping that they would be smart, that they, they would be savvy and, and shrewd with what, what they've been given now, not for worldly gain like the manager did, but for spiritual gain throughout eternity. We need to be good stewards of what God has given us. Why? Because the stuff that God has given us in, in our life, our possessions, our jobs, our wealth, our families, everything that we have, it's not really ours, is it? No, everything that we have, we have because God has decided to give it to us. He is the one who owns it. And we're just the managers, the, the, the stewards of God's stuff. But then the, the Pharisees, they got involved into the conversation. They, they jumped into a conversation and, and because uh, Luke tells us that they dearly, dearly loved their money. Money was their master, not God. They, they were devoted to money. They weren't devoted to following God. You see, the, the, disciple, or the, the Pharisees had made money their idols, and they loved and worshipped their money. They didn't worship God. And there's a warning in, in that for all of us, right? If we love blank, fill in that blank of whatever it is for you, if we love that thing more than God, then that will become an idol for us. If you love money more than God, money will become an idol, if, if you love working more than God, then that will become an idol. If you love drawing or scrapbooking or cooking or watching sports or looking at your phone or, or your clothes or, or anything else that you have more than God, that thing is an idol. Those things that, uh, which, which God has given us for us to care for, for us to manage, to steward those things that were meant to be a blessing for us, they can be turned into something that, that we elevate higher than God and they become idols. And it's, it's easy to do that, right? It, it's, it's all too easy for those, those material things in this material world that we live in to become our idols. So we need to be good stewards of what God has given us. We need to surrender the, the feeling of the ownership that we have over these things that God has given us. We need to surrender the idols that have been replaced God in our worship. And that was the first half of chapter 16. We need to be faithful stewards. And today we're going to be looking at the, the second half, another parable in chapter 16 on the issue of stewardship. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn them on if they're electronic. We'll be in the second half of chapter 16 in the book of Luke today. But first, I want to set up our scripture before we dive in. Today's parable, it mentions another two people, another rich man and a guy named Lazarus. And now some argue that there are several features in this story, in this parable, that are not typical of a normal parable. During this time, I'm sorry, the, the most notable feature that is different is that one of the characters actually has a name. The, the, this poor man that we're going to read about, his, his name is Lazarus. And during this time period, Lazarus was a fairly common name. It was similar to what we would think of as, as a Steve or a Mike or a Mark, a, a very common name, Lazarus. And this leads us to the next idea that it, it's and it, it's almost unanimous, unanimously understood that the Lazarus in this story, in this parable, is not meant to be understood as the Lazarus that we know in Jesus' story, the one that Jesus raised from the dead in John chapter 11. There's no evidence to suggest that Jesus was referring to the Lazarus that was raised from the dead in this parable. This poor guy in this, this story was just given a, a random name, The, the last thing to note before we jump in, and this one is important, we need to remember that this is a parable. And it doesn't necessarily give us literal information about the conditions of the afterlife. Some of you know what we're going to be looking at today, and that's great. But this parable doesn't give us the liter literal information about the conditions of the afterlife. 
If you remember, I said this last week, parables are stories that are meant, uh, that, that are told with the intention of teaching one main point. And this is a, a common passage that people turn to and use when discussing what might happen in the afterlife when people die and go to heaven or hell. But, but that's not the main point that we're trying to get through when Jesus is teaching here. So it's wrong to take this passage as an accurate portrayal of how we will interact with other people once we get to the end of our life. But there's another lesson that we're going to learn here. Does that make sense? We want to make sure that we are exegeting Scripture. We're always exegeting Scripture, that, that we're reading the meaning that was put into the text by God himself. And never eisegeting Scripture. We never want to put our own meaning into Scripture. We are exegeters of God's word. Amen? Awesome. So Luke 16, starting in verse 19. Jesus, if you remember, was talking to his disciples. Then the Pharisees joined in the conversation. And Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. So like I said just a minute ago, there were, uh, there were two men. We have this rich man, and we have this poor man, Lazarus. The rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen. And purple, as, as you may know, was the color of royalty. It was the color of authority, the color of wealth. It would have been pretty common for the Pharisees at this time to be adorned with something purple. Maybe not fully in purple, but they would have had a garment or an accessory of purple wrapped around them. And, and, and Jesus is probably uh, pretty pointedly trying to make a connection here to the Pharisees with this rich man. Anyways, we, we see this rich man, he lived a life of luxury. In the, in the ESV Bible, I liked what it said here. It said that the rich man feasted sumptuously. And that's a fantastic word, sumptuously. Sumptuously means extremely costly, rich, luxurious, or magnificent. And he was feasting this way. Has anybody ever had a meal that they would define as sumptuous? Maybe. Man, this is the time when we say every meal that our wife cooks is sumptuous. There's a, a restaurant in Denver, and, and I looked last, last night, and there's apparently one in Lincoln, too. It's called Rodizio's Brazilian Steakhouse. Has anybody ever eaten there before? It's one of my favorite all-time restaurants, and, and you're about to hear why. The place is yummy. Expensive, but yummy. When I was 15, I, I went on a 10-day mission trip to Belarus with my church. And the night before we left, the six of us that were going on this trip, they, they took us and our families out to Rodizio's for a goodbye supper. And back then, if I remember right, it was about $45 a person to eat at this place. Worth every penny. If you haven't been there, it's, it's, a, it's one of those places that's an all-you-could-eat style of restaurant, but it's not a buffet. The, the meat comes to you. And then there are several servers who walk around with all sorts of meat, and, and, and they're on big skewers, and they're walking around with these skewers of meat, and they come to your table and slice off the portion that you want, and it's all you can eat. They, they will never stop coming to your table until you ask them to stop. And I'm talking about, uh, I looked at the menu, it, it, glazed garlic tri-tip sirloin, parmesan-crusted center-cut steak, bacon-wrapped grilled chicken, slow-roasted bone-in chicken thighs, house-rolled spicy pork sausages, smoked pork chops, garlic mar marinated lamb chops, and these these perfectly grilled shrimp that I remember. They're about the size of my fist. Fantastic. It was the definition of sumptuous. I've probably gone too far with this food illustration before lunchtime. 
But that's what I imagine when, when I read that this rich man was living this life of luxury every day. I imagined him reclining at a table and these, these men bringing him meat on skewers whenever he wanted, as much as he wanted. That is what I imagine when I hear that he feasted sumptuously. But then we have this contrast with this poor man who, who Jesus named Lazarus. Perhaps Lazarus was a name of an actual man that he met on his travels who exemplified this description. But this poor man was laying at the gates of the rich man, covered in sores, begging for the scraps of food that fell off the table of the rich man. These two men that Jesus described, they couldn't be any different at first sight, right? However, the, the gap gets even bigger when we consider the Jewish customs and beliefs of that time. You see, Jewish leaders had always taught that wealth was a sign of God's favor, of God's blessings, and, and, and poverty was a sign of God's punishment. If you were being punished by God, you would be stricken down into poverty. If you were a godly person, you'd be elevated to a position of wealth. So the, the Pharisees listening in the crowd, they would have immediately thought that this rich man was the godly man, right? And, and this poor man must have done something. He was just a, a sinner and, and a, a, a pretty bad sinner knowing that he was uh, laying by a gate begging for food, having his, his sores licked by dogs. That's about as low as you could possibly go. He must be a bad sinner. Keep that in mind as we read this next part of the passage. Verse 22, finally the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. Strange, that doesn't quite fit the Jewish narrative, does it? Imagine that the shock and the surprise of the audience listening to Jesus, both the Pharisees and the disciples alike. They've been brought up thinking that wealth was meant to be God's favor and poverty was a sign that you did something bad against God. So what did they think when the rich man in Jesus' story was, was at the place of the dead, looking at, at Abraham and, and Lazarus, hanging out in heaven over here. That probably didn't sit right with very many of them in that, in that group, did it? I, I, I love Jesus' bold teaching continuing here in this passage. Before we continue, though, we need to recognize that, that Jesus believes in a real heaven and a real earth and a real hell. Jesus believes in a real heaven and a real hell. The Pharisees in the, in the New Living Translation uses uh, the phrase in verse 23, the place of the dead. In, in the original Greek, this is the word that, that gets translated to the word Hades. In, in popular Jewish belief, Hades can be translated as the abode or the home of the dead, and it's understood to be a real place, but otherwise a, a, a shadowy place that that the wicked dead remained to until the time of judgment. So the audience, when, when, when Jesus said that the place of the dead or, or Hades, whatever your translation says, they would have understood this to be a very real place. And we could spend months talking about this topic, and, and, but, but I, what I want us to really focus on here is that, that Jesus completely believes in a real heaven and a real earth. Sorry, a real hell. <laughs> Sometimes the same, right? A person who dies is going to go to either one, heaven or hell. There is no in-between. There is no purgatory, no do-overs, no mulligans, no try-agains, no restarts. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, Each person is destined to die once. And after that comes judgment. That is our destiny as people. Heaven and hell are real places. And each person who is alive right now, who has been alive in the past, and who will be alive in the future, will one day end up in one of those two places when they die. There's no way around that. Let's continue with Jesus' teaching here. And we're actually going to read to the end of the passage here, starting in verse 24. It says, The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here. And no one can cross over from, from us there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone raises from the dead. So we've seen this conversation happening here between the rich man and Abraham. Did you notice how Lazarus never has a speaking part in this parable? I never thought about that until this week, but, but the character that was named in this story never actually gets to speak. However, we do see that the rich man spoke a few times. He pleads with Abraham's, Abraham for two things in these verses. First off, he's in hell. And he's crying out for mercy. He wants a drop of water to cool his tongue because he's in anguish in the flames. Before his death, he was reclining at the table eating that, that garlic-glazed tri-tip tri steak. That's a tongue twister. bacon-wrapped chicken thighs, the whole thing. But now we see him thirsting for just a drop of water to cool his tongue. Verse 24 gives us a, a pretty clear picture of the desperation in hell, doesn't it? Of the agony and the conscious torment that is in God's condemnation. The second thing that the rich man pleads for is for his family. But notice how he only cared for them after he tried to take care of himself. Apparently selfishness is not quenched in hell. Before his death, the, the rich man lived a luxurious life. He didn't care for the poor man at his gates. And here, he still doesn't care for anybody but number one first. Even in his current state in hell, the rich man wanted Abraham to command Lazarus to serve him by dipping his finger in water to soothe his tongue and then sending Lazarus out of the comfort of God back to earth to warn his brothers. But now, and we can't miss this, the rich man remained fully conscious of the suffering and the torment that was around him. Among his suffering and, and his torment featured are, are unquenchable flames and, and memories of lost opportunities. 
and those are bad, but, but the worst suffering of all was the permanent, irreversible separation from God and everything good. That is hell, folks. Church, hell is not a place of dreams. It is not a place without feeling. The Bible doesn't present an afterlife of an eternal sleep or, or as annihilation without suffering. Hell is a place of intense suffering because God has removed even the, the common grace that we experience here on earth. Even those who aren't Christians get to experience this common grace. Hell doesn't have that. Being utterly and completely removed from God's grace leaves only misery and sorrow. And we could never imagine what horrible, horrible sufferings that would be to be completely removed from God's love and mercy. I hope you know this about me by now, but I'm not a hellfire and brimstone type preacher. I never will be. I, I think that, that there's a place and time for that message to happen when it is appropriate and necessary, but that's not really who I am. I believe that, that telling people about God's grace and God's mercy and God's love is far more effective way of sharing the gospel. That being said, the way that Jesus teaches and describes hell in this passage, and the way that God describes hell throughout the, the entirety of Scripture, there should be a fire that's lit on our backsides to get us out the door to tell the world about Jesus' love. Amen? Amen? Even the rich man agrees. Even though he was, he, he thought of himself first, he still warned his, he, he wanted to warn his family. He didn't want those who he loved to join him in hell. If our loved ones who have, who have died apart from Jesus could come back to us and speak to us today, they would beg us to repent and follow Jesus and do whatever it takes not to join them in hell. Perhaps you have a loved one who has died without accepting Jesus as their Savior and Lord, apart from Jesus. And the thought of that hurts you, and I get that. I understand that pain. My, my dad's mom passed away some 20 years ago. She did not care about God. She despised going to church, and she hated the fact that my mom forced him to go to church when they got married. I have no reason to think that she is not currently in that place of complete separation from God, experiencing that un, uh, unthinkable torment for eternity. And if she could come back right now for just a few minutes, she wouldn't care about the job that I have or the car that I have, or, or the amount of money that's in my bank account, I guarantee you that she would come back and with every last second she had would tell us to confess our sins to God, to turn away from sin and trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. I have no doubt. The rich man wanted a drop of water, and he wanted to warn his brothers. And both times the rich man pleads for something, Abraham responds. First, Abraham, Abraham said, it is impossible to send Lazarus with water. It can't be done because the chasm is too great. That word chasm that is seen there in verse 26 is a term that's only found here in this passage, and it describes an unbridgeable space. Two sides cannot be reached by one another. And from this passage, we get this picture that, that there is no engagement or, or communication between the two realms, save for this hypothetical conversation we see here in this parable. Then Abraham responded to the second request, and he said, it is foolish to send Lazarus to inform your brothers. They have all the information they need available in the scriptures. I don't want you to miss what Jesus is, 
is saying here in this, this parable. Don't, don't miss this because it's so good. Jesus' audience consists of disciples, but also the Pharisees, the, the self-proclaimed experts in all things law and scripture. So I want you to see what Jesus did here at the end of chapter 16. Jesus is telling them that you have all the answers. You have the writings of Moses and the other prophets. You have all this. You have these teachings, and you still don't get it. All these people have warned you for years. And even a person coming back from the dead won't change your mind. You see the, the foreshadowing of what is to come once Jesus gets to Jerusalem here, right? Even after Jesus' resurrection, the Pharisees still didn't believe that he was God. They had the scriptures, they had the man coming back from dead, and they still didn't believe. This is incredible stuff. There are a few more things I want to point out from this passage, though. Verse 25 tells us that Lazarus had a lifetime of suffering. But once he got to that heavenly banquet, we read that it was his turn to enjoy comfort of being with God. If you are a believer in Jesus as your Savior, all your sufferings will be turned into comfort when you enter God's presence. Suffering turns to joy, we read. The first will be last, and the last will be first, we read. There is no shame for those who are in Christ, we read. Isn't that great? Isn't it great to see this picture of Lazarus sitting with Abraham, a picture of our fellowship with God once we get to heaven, and knowing that God's comfort can never be taken away from him, from us? We can be certain that, that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, nothing can change the destination we are headed towards when we die. Unfortunately, the same is true for those who die without faith in Christ. As it was for this rich man. There is a, a great chasm in place that no one can pass from hell to heaven or from heaven to hell. Once you're there, you are there for eternity. And that means that humanity only gets one shot to get it right. There is no second chance to get it right. We don't get an opportunity to send a message back to tell our, our loved ones once it's too late for us on this earth. There should be a sense of urgency in this passage, right, when we read it? Why do we hesitate to tell others about Jesus' sacrifice and forgiveness and love when we know that, that them not knowing these things means that they will exper experience that eternal torment of godlessness for all of eternity? Why do we hesitate? I say we because I am just as guilty in this as you are. And some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, I'm not sure what to say. I don't have all the answers. I, I, I'm going to, to mess things up, and it's just going to make things worse for the person. And I say to you, look what, look what Jesus just said in this passage. Jesus said, read the words. Everything you need to know has been given to you in Scripture. This book holds all the answers. You don't need the answers. This book has the answers. This book points people towards the right direction. We don't have to know all the answers. I don't know all the answers. But we have God's word to take with us, to study, to learn from. And we can rely on the Holy Spirit in those times of struggle when we don't have the answers to guide us in our conversations, right? There's a quick plug for Wednesday night Bible study. We're, we're going through uh, the, this book, and it's about the reliance that we have, that we need to have on the Holy Spirit. 
It's a challenging book, but a great reminder that, that the power of the Spirit that we've forgotten and we desperately need to get back to. Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Anyways, here's a question that we all need to be asking ourselves. Every time we read, read Scripture, we need to ask ourselves the question, so what? What can we take from these verses and apply them to our lives this week? So what? The lesson of this parable is simple. Every person will experience a time when it will be too late to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. So figure it out before your life comes to an end. It's pretty simple. Essentially, we need to be faithful stewards of souls. God has given us a soul. We need to steward that soul. First of all, if you were here today and you've not made the decision to believe in Jesus as your Savior, my prayer for you now is that today is the day that you do that. You're not promised another second on this earth, much less a lifetime to make this decision. Jesus preached urgency. I'm preaching urgency too. Your life is precious and Jesus loves you. And he wants, you, he wants to forgive you for the sins in your life. And all you need to do before you die is to believe that he died to forgive your sins. And if you believe that when you do die, whenever that may be, you will get to experience that eternal goodness that is being in the presence of God forever and ever. Please don't wait until it's too late. Because being too late means that you're going to experience the exact opposite. Separation from all that is good for all of eternity. If you need to make that decision today, come find me. Come talk to me. I would love to talk to you about that. For those of you who have made that decision already, whether it was yesterday, last week, 50 years ago, I have a question for you. What are you waiting for? Are you being a faithful steward of the good news of Jesus Christ? I know there's someone in your life right now that is coming to your mind as I'm talking who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. Why aren't you urgently telling them about Jesus? I challenge you to do something about that this week. I challenge you to do something about that today. Urgency. Don't wait until later on this week. Do it today. Reach out to someone you know who doesn't know Christ. Be bold like Jesus was and be bold to tell that person, do you know what? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And then share the gospel with that person. Will you do that today? Is anyone bold enough to take that challenge? Will you urgently tell someone about the good news of Jesus Christ? I pray that you will have that boldness to do that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are we thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. For raising him again back to life as the conqueror of death. Father, I pray for those of us who know Christ to be filled with your boldness. To share the gospel to this world that is lost going to hell. Father, allow us to reach out to those people with love and truth. Father, for those who are, who are going to hear that message, soften their hearts. Allow them to be open and welcoming of that message of your love and their need for forgiveness and repentance.
We love you. We praise you for how great you are. We pray this in your name. Amen. One zero one.